Um, my name is C.W. Mayberry uh, of Torah Observant Apostolics in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, if you're watching this, uh, I pray for you. I pray for your households. I pray for the increase in the understanding of the Word of God and the depth and the breadth of uh, your walk in the Spirit um, going forward as the days that we're living in are going to require greater things than we've come to thus far. Our God is great. And he has brought us to great depths and great heights. But the, the era we're entering into is going to require um, even more uh, of the understanding of the Word of God, the ability to move in the Spirit, um, I, I guess I'm going to do something uh, a little bit unusual. I've never heard uh, a minister do this. Um, and I'm a little bit hesitant, but I don't want you to misunderstand. Okay. Um, the last week of my life has been one of the most pressing that I have experienced in quite some time. I'm talking about the supernatural opposition to what we're doing here. Okay. Um, I'm not faint. I'm not weak. I'm not about to fail. But I want you to understand if it comes to me first, it will visit you as well. That's just the way these things operate. Uh, the shepherd sees it all first. Um, we've been warring against these things. If you want to pray for somebody over the next few weeks, uh, pray for me. Uh, I'm certainly praying for you. I don't anticipate any problem. Um, you know, my mother used to talk about growing pains. It's just growing pains. Uh, I'll be going through something and she just totally disregarded me. It's just growing pains. You know, years later you find out, well, that's exactly what it was. It's just something you had to, to, to deal with and experience in order to get to the next place you're going. Um, and, uh, that's true of everybody. You know, leadership never stops growing. It, it, they, they shouldn't. Um, they never stop maturing. Uh, they never stop becoming more like Yeshua. Um, um, and I hope that's true, but I certainly haven't arrived. Um, I, I don't want that yardstick put up next to me quite yet um, because I'm not there. But I would appreciate your prayers uh, and the covering of, of this body going forward. Um, some things have become apparent to me that need adjustment in my walk. And we're going to do those things and see the fruit of it and go forward. Um, to anyone who's interested, my vehicle will be uh, at the Kia dealership. Let's break this up at 8 o'clock Monday morning and to rectify our problems down there. Take care of that. You never go wrong going back to the basics. You never go wrong going back to the fundamentals. If I can get you to open your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 6. I want to spend a little time in things that I know we already know. But as many times as I've read this Bible, I continue to get revelation from it. I'm going to change the Bibles again. Look at that. Fred G. Praise God. I am in the book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 1. You never go wrong going back to the fundamentals. And I love to teach from the Word of God because I've always got my notes handy. And it's always the best material you could possibly find. Okay. Romans 6 and 1 says, What shall we say then? Have I lost you? I don't know what this thing is doing. Hold on, folks. Hey, just sit along. I don't know what happened. Okay, we're back. Well, we were back. That's where we want to be. Thank you. I apologize for the interruption. Technology. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I started to read the, the preface before this, 
uh, but it was really going to be too much material. Um, so we'll pick it up here. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus, Yeshua, were baptized into his death. So as he died, we die also. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And you can glance over that and keep going uh, without giving it much consideration, but he begins to discuss things here that tell us why it's so important to be baptized, why baptism isn't just an empty ordinance. Um, if you're going to live in that newness of life, you're going to have to experience baptism, full body water immersion, with the invocation of the name of Yeshua. Nothing magical about that water. It's simply a matter of obedience. An act of obedience got us into a world of sin, listening to Satan and obeying his voice. And obedience, listening to and obeying the voice of God, is the only thing that's going to deliver us from that, that circumstance. All right? Verse 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. If you want to be like him, you've got to go through that. And that word planted in the Greek, uh, translated into English, is, is conjoined. It's uh, rooted in the word congenital. That watery grave, which is a tomb, suddenly becomes a womb out of which a new living being is born. Okay, praise God. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Every sinful act an individual partakes in constitutes a contractual agreement between that individual and the spirit that led them to that. All right. The Apostle Paul says later, later on in Romans that whosoever you obey, you become the servants of that individual, either the sin, sin unto death or, or righteousness un, unto life. So everything we have done up until the point that we come to the knowledge of, of, of Yeshua has made agreement after agreement after agreement with hell that we signed off on. What happens in water baptism is that all those agreements are nullified and people are released from the obligations thereof. I've watched it time after time. You baptize people, they go down with one temperament, one attitude, one personality, and they come up with a different temperament, enough, a different personality, um, because they're being separated from that sin. Excuse me, that sin. We are in Romans chapter 6. If no one caught that, my assistant here, let me know to say that again. Okay. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if he be dead, now, now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, no more, yeah, dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died once to sin, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign or have dominion in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. There is a vast difference from occasionally giving in to the, the, the lust of the flesh, the desires of this body, and living that way as a lifestyle, okay? We still, because we are in this body, in this world, have to deal with the inclinations of this body. But that's a, a, a world away from being a professional sinner, 
before I met Yeshua, I was a professional sinner. I was trying to do everything I could to, to take hold of what felt good, looked good, seemed good unto me, not realizing all those things were bringing me closer and closer to my own destruction. Um, so there's a, a great difference between somebody who lives in that lifestyle and being uh, in resistance to it. Okay. All right. Verse 13. 13. Neither yield you your members as, as, as instruments of, to, of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Very simply put, you know, get a, you need to start getting involved in the king's business. First and foremost in your own life, learning to pray, learning to open this book, learning to absorb this word, even if you don't have the degree of comprehension you want to at first, then finding a way to do something good for someone else in the name of the king and the kingdom, just to be just be kind towards people uh, and show them the love of God in any way that you can find possible to do. It's really that simple. Make a habit of it. All right. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, there it is, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You know, human beings fulfill a unique place in this universe. Um, we are neither, we really are neither darkness nor light. We are somewhere in between, but we become more of whichever we involve ourselves with. If we involve ourselves with God, which is light, we're going to become more enlightened, more luminescent. We're going to show forth more of his personality in, in this world. And the opposite is true as well. Verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart from that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. And he talks about being freed from sin. You know, it's possible to take something that God has given us as a normal and natural human drive and to take it beyond the parameters of what is normal. And I'm being very careful with my words here. Um, to the point that something that would have been an occasional activity now becomes an obsession. You almost can't stop pursuing it and pursuing it in, God, in ways God never intended. That's what sin does. It uses the God-given drives that we have um, and causes it to become an instrument of slavery, okay? You know, it's like the difference between do you eat to live you got to have nutrition. Or do you live to eat? I eat when I'm not hungry. I eat when I'm sad. I eat when I'm hungry, when I'm happy. I eat when I'm mad. I eat when I bump into something. I'm, just, I'm you know, it's a seafood diet. I see it, I eat it. You've taken it beyond what God intended. And and that's, that's the most wholesome example I can give you. You can use your imaginations. People have been trapped in all manner of behavior they wouldn't want anyone to know about because they've taken things that God has given them under the direction of spirits and gone beyond it to the, to the point where they can't stop themselves. That's a spirit in operation in your flesh. You yielded yourself to it so often that it now has a great deal of control over your psychology, all right? All that can be broken. I'm not saying it can't. I don't want to glorify the enemy it's, it's it's easily broken for the individual who wants uh it broken and wants to live a, a righteous and holy and, right, and, and wholesome life all right where will leave off that yes 
I think matches are terrible. 21, what fruit? I don't think so. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. The understanding wasn't quite where it should be. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, and to, unto iniquity, even so yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. The paradigm is the same in the opposite direction. If you'll just to, to begin to do what's right, it will become natural. You will train yourself to follow after that as, as, a, as opposed to automatically falling into the wrong thing. You'll find yourself rising up. You know, I used to, well, I'll tell you the honest to God's truth. I used to get up out of bed, and the first thing I was looking for was a cigarette. And now I get out of bed, and the first thing I say is, praise God. What can I do for you? What can I do for you today, Jesus? You know, it becomes a different reality. And your mind is set in that direction automatically because you've done it so often. You've trained yourself that way. All right. Verse 24, when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. We may not realize that while we're doing it, but that is the ultimate end of it. But now being made from free from sin and become servants of God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. That is the culmination of all that we're going through. That's what that's why we continue to fight this warfare is because there, we know there's another reality coming. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And if I may interject, the Bible says that repent and be baptized every one of you and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I would put forth the idea that the Holy Ghost is not the gift that the Holy Ghost is the gift giver. And that gift is eternal life. That spirit living in you will move you continually toward that goal. Verse chapter seven and verse one. Know ye not brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. He's talking to these Jews. How that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as so long as the husband liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So she no longer has obligation to him once he is passed on. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. And that's quite a scandalous situation. But if her husband be dead and she is freed from the, that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's exactly what happens. A human being is always going to serve some spirit. That's just the way it is. Uh, Paul talks about the children of disobedience that serve the prince of the power of the air. It's all, every human being is being motivated by some spirit to which they have yielded themselves. When you go down in that baptismal tank with the invocation of the name, okay, it breaks all those agreements and it restructures your personality. It restructures your inclinations. I've seen it time and time again. People come up, you know, having no desire for things that they had lived with their entire life. All of that was broken off. We, what, did you, what really has happened is Yeshua in that baptismal tank has dispossessed that spirit and moved into that place himself. He literally has given it the boot in your life and taken possession of that vessel your body himself and now inhabits inhabits it and leaves very little room for anything else okay i mean it's, it's all a process but that's the general idea all right verse four wherefore my brethren ye also are become dead to the law by the body of christ that ye should 
be married to another, even to him that is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we are held, we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What, sorry, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The point of the giving of the Ten Commandments was to show mankind that they couldn't keep the Ten Commandments. It was to demonstrate their inability. You know, you, you and, and, and he uses the word covet there. You get in a situation where I want this, I want that, I want the other thing. That That's America. That's Western culture. You know, get all you can, can all you get, pile it as high as you can. But when God comes to you and says that kind of thinking, that kind of activity is sin because you have made your possessions and the acquisition of possessions your God, and you've left no place for the living God, it becomes obvious. How many people have said, I can't serve God because I would have to give up this or I would have to give up that? And even the rich young ruler was told, go and sell all that you have. And the Bible says he was very grieved over that because he had great possessions. His possessions had become his God. Possessions that he is going to leave in this world when he dies, which will be inherited by whoever. He has nothing to say about it. Distributed, used, sold, without his consent whatsoever. He would have been better off clinging to the living God, and so would we. Praise God. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, which is overflowing sin. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. It was ordained unto life because if you could have kept it, it would have produced life. But because we don't have the ability to keep it, it produces death. All right. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by the which, by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. No, the law is not wrong. The law is there to point out your problem. The law is there it, it, like a, a, a wall for you to run into because you're involved in this, that, and the other thing, and you have no idea that it's destroying you. So God sets forth the commandment, and all of a sudden I realize, man, uh, you know, he says, stop eating, you know, fudge sickles on Tuesday. Man, I've been eating 100 fudge sickles every Tuesday for my entire life. Now I understand there's a problem with it. That's where all this weight's coming from. This is why I'm fat. That's kind of funny. It sounds like a joke, but that's the real, the real working mechanism of it. He points, he pulls these things out so that we become aware of it. And you, as we go forward, the things become finer and finer and finer. What do I mean by that? When you first come to God, you know, what do people do? They quit drinking, they quit smoking, they quit, you know, cheating the boss because these are big things in their lives. They, they know they're not supposed to be doing that. Okay? It's obvious. Mistreating your spouse, he, she, or, well, I'm not going to say it. That there is no it. But it, it, it brings it to a sharp point so you understand it. Then later on, as you progress, it goes from being physical acts and words you speak to attitudes you hold. You know? looking at people and evaluating them, you know, well, God's going to be able to do with anything with that one. I don't know. That's really not your place. 
Your place is to preach the word and to put it out there and let God deal with the individual on his basis. Because friend, I know from personal experience, it's almost impossible to pick the winners and the losers, right? If you want to put it in those terms, I watch people use people. I watch God use people and I'm thinking, man, I don't see how. And I've seen people who had every advantage fail just, just completely. All right. But it's the attitude that I've got the right to evaluate people. That's sin. Because in your mind, you're judging them, not evaluating what they're doing, but calculating the end of their life and saying, no sense messing with that one. No profit there. They're never going to make it. You just condemn them in your mind to a devil's hell. That's sin. Okay. So you put it out there and let God sort them out. Praise God. Verse 13, was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. No, we're going down to 15, 14. Thank you, man. For we know that the law is spiritual. Hang on to that for a minute. The Torah is spiritual because you have to be spiritual in order to keep it. This is why it can't, it could, could have never been done away with. You can't do away with the nature of God in the universe, right? We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. I am a meatball sold under sin for that which I do, I allow not. I have sworn so many times I'm going to quit doing that. And then I wake up, I find, look, my hand's in the cookie jar again. I don't even know how it got there. Praise God. For what I would that I do not. And I know I need to get up tomorrow morning and go knock on so-and-so's door and have a conversation about them, but I never seem to be able to get myself down there. I know I need to uh, spend more time in prayer and in study, but I never seem to get there. That's sin as well. But what I hate that I do, if then I, if then I do that which I would not, and I consent unto the law that it is good, because the law is working. It's showing you your problem. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. The human body is like a supernatural piece of real estate. When a person is born again, they are largely separated from sin, but we always still have that proclivity to, to answer those things. And there's always those uh, inclinations toward them. The body's always trying to reach for something it should not have, which is why the Bible tells us that in being born again, in being uh, baptized in Yeshua's name, what is redeemed there is the spirit. Okay, What we have not got redeemed as of yet is the flesh in which we dwell, and that is the source of all our problems and conflicts. We still dwell in a body that has an inclination towards sin. And unfortunately, um, there is some interaction with the spirit that drives that. That's just a reality, all right? Praise God. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. And ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to tell me that's not you, uh, you're lying to yourself. Okay, I'm still dealing with stuff. And probably will be to the day I die. Now, if I do not, if I, sorry, now, if, now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that, that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members a wretched man that i am who shall deliver me from this body of 
death. If you had that new body, which we've been promised, you would not have these inclinations. And I, I wish I had a more perfect understanding of the way this works, okay? But as long as you were in this world, in that body, you are susceptible to temptation. And the devil is very, very subtle. And we find ourselves giving things over and having to take them back because of our immaturity, because of our, our ignorance, because of our inexperience. Um, but that's why there's hope. We're growing. We're going to continue to grow. All right. I thank God through Yeshua Messiah, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Verse eight. You know, when they, when they broke this Bible up into chapter and verse, that's very helpful. But sometimes it, it really just is, is terrible because that is actually a natural flow between those two verses. And there shouldn't be uh, the beginning of another chapter there. So let's, I'm going to go back and I'm going to read the last verse of, of, of seven. Because I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. There is therefore now what? No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Look, you're going to blow it. It's going to happen. Okay. Do not destroy yourself over it. Do not allow the devil to condemn you over it. He's the chiefest of all sinners. He's the moron that started this corruption and introduced it into the world. If anybody's guilty of sin, it's the demonic, it's the demons, it's the devils. Friend, I've done nothing near to what you've done, and you've got no recourse. I'm not going to hear your prayer statement. God. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Because Yeshua came and shed his blood and made it possible for us to have the indwelling of the living God in us, we now have the power to overcome these things, many of them immediately upon conversion, others as we go through and and the law, the word shows us where we are and, and what we're involved in and points out things that we need to be dealing with. That's what this that's what sanctification is. It's setting apart. He's cleansing us day by day by day. We're becoming more and more and more like him. Do not destroy yourself over some failure. Get up, repent, and move on and grow and learn and have grace for other people um, who you're going to come across who are going to have the same problem and be an encouragement to them. Praise God. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. What do you sit around and talk about, you know, with with uh, your your fellow believers? Okay, are we all talking about the the next new car, the next new house, the next new whatever? Are we talking about how do we move this forward? What what should we be doing right now to to to, to be as productive for the kingdom of God as we possibly can. How do we fill this house? You know, you know, uh, is, is that where your mindset is? Is where it should be? Praise God. For to be carnally minded is death. Nothing in this world that profits you is, is going to, to, to last forever. It's going to pass away and you're going to die. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. It's the antithesis of the law of God. He says, go out and help people to live. You know, and, and our nature says that people get in your way. I'll just move them out of your way by whatever means necessary. You know, he says that, you know, you should be content with what you've got. 
because you've got Yeshua's presence in your life and the promise of eternal life. If you're not keeping up with the Joneses in this world, it's really not that big a deal and it shouldn't concern you that much. If it does, you're living in opposition to the will of God because if you've got to spend all your time getting stuff and working overtime to pay for that stuff, well, how much time does that leave for prayer, study, Bible study? You know, you have to strike that balance. Everybody's got to work. Everybody's got to eat. Everybody's got to put kids on the shoes' feet. You know, that's the other way around. Excuse me. Everybody's got to put shoes on the kids' uh, feet. But when you have to have more and more and more to the exclusion of your ability to work in the kingdom, you're in sin. All right. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. That's what we want. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let me add right there. You need to find a way to determine that you indeed have the spirit of Christ. The Bible gives you the answer. I'm not going to go into it, but it is that important. You have got to know that you have received the indwelling of the spirit of the living God. Don't let anybody tell you that it's just automatic. All right. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. He's talking about the second coming by his spirit that dwelleth in you. It's just like the, the, the parable of, of the, the ten virgins. You know, five of them ran out of oil. Oil, oil is, is, a uh, a, a symbol for the Holy Ghost, you know, for the Ruach HaKadosh, for the, the Spirit of God. Okay? You want to be full of the Spirit at all times, and that is uh, your responsibility. God makes it available. All right. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. How do you mortify the deeds of the body? It's through prayer, it's through fasting, it's through study of the word of God, and it's through and it's through acting out these things in your life, um, trying to be a vehicle through which other people come to this life. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. He's talking about the phenomenon of tongues that occurs at the uh, infilling. And if the children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, so be that ye suffer with him, so be that we, yeah, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. For our earnest expectation, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, emptiness, this war that we fight, not willingly, but by reason of him who have subjected it to the same in hope. God set this process up. Don't fight the process. Work with it. God set the process up. Because the creature itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. There will come a day when we reclaim this body, and it becomes what it should be. All right? For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. I don't care what anybody says. That's what earthquakes are about. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit. If you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's just the first fruits. That's the earnest of the inheritance. There's more of that to come. What you're dealing with is a is, is a down payment, as magnificent as it is. It's a down payment. Okay. 
And not only they, but we ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. There's just something that tells me I don't belong in this state. I know there's a better state of being coming, and and I can't wait to get there. I'm so tired of dealing with these frustrations and these warfares and and having to 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 push back against things all the time i'm not going to stop doing it but man if i could put the devil in a box i would shake it shake it shake it shake it i can't wait until he finally burns he's got he does not love me all right For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For that which a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? But if we hope that we hope for that we'll see not, then do we with our patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Now pay attention to this. Likewise, the Spirit, he's talking about the Holy Ghost, the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses, our ignorances, our blindnesses, our lack of knowledge, our lack of understanding, our lack of wisdom, okay? For we know not what we should pray. I don't know what's going on, God. I got no idea what this situation is. This is a brand new conundrum that has been dropped on me, and I got no idea what to do with it, okay? For we know not what we should pray as as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered when you go to prayer if you have never experienced this and you begin to become extremely sorrowful okay tears sobs the body itself even begins to contract to do that the the, the core um and you you don't know what that's about there are no words for it don't resist it you are either interceding for another individual somewhere on behalf of God or to God doing it through you, or you're interceding for yourself. Let him pray through you. And in, there are prayers that involve words. There are prayers that involve tongues, okay, the supernatural utterance. And then there are prayers that are nothing more than guttural groans and mourns and cries and shrieks. Um, if you've never experienced it, experienced it or been around someone who is experiencing it, it, it can be quite unnerving, okay? But it is that deep desire to be out of this present condition and into the presence of the living God. Because before I knew there was a Yeshua, before I knew there was another kingdom to come, before I was aware that there was another world that was going to be brought into being, I, I didn't I didn't mourn for those things. I didn't weep for those things. Now that I have tasted of that world, and the further I get into this walk, and the more I leave Babylon behind, the more I'm desirous. And the Bible says that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. Where a city where it's pure, where no sin in enters in at all. There is no darkness. There is no shadow of turning. It is absolute, perfect, and holy. Because I have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I now from time to time find myself longing you know, to move on to that final uh, manifestation of, of what God's going to make me into and the world is going to bring me into. Um, so what does all this boil down to? I think it all goes back to there is now there there is therefore now con- no condemnation to them that are in Messiah. Okay? It's a struggle. It's a warfare. It's going to be a warfare. There are going to be mountaintops and there are going to be valleys. And I hate to tell you this, the mountaintops get higher, and the glory and the power and the visitation of God gets broader and more marvelous. And then the valley gets darker and deeper okay? because these things have to be purged out of us in order for us to be prepared to receive um, what he wants us to have 
and he's the author of all this. He understood the nature of man when he made Adam. He knew there was going to be a failure. He chose to use the failure. You know, God can use anything, and he is using the failure to make us what we should be. This is why it's so important for people to study the Word of God and to know the Word of God. Nobody's going to stumble into the kingdom of God by accident. Nobody's going to stumble into the kingdom of God because they got their uh, card checked every Sunday for 40 years at the local whatever church. You know, just showing up doesn't buy you a seat. You've got to be involved in this thing. You've got to be involved in the crucifixion of your own flesh. You've got to be involved in promoting the kingdom by some way, means, or form. And we're all different. Nobody's, not everybody's an Apostle Paul. Almost nobody is an Apostle Paul. But we can be somebody, but everybody can be somebody's Apostle. There's, everybody's got someone out there they can reach and impact. I've seen people tell me, you know, at the beginning of their walk, oh, I don't know about that. You know, you just do the preaching and I'll sit here. And I tell them, not so. The day is coming where you're going to be doing the preaching. You know, a few years later, not only are they doing it, they're enjoying it. Because they're now on top. They're not, they're not being, you know, cast about like ignorant children anymore. They now have understanding and power and authority in this world. In the name of Yeshua. Great and mighty God, I ask you to touch this household. Touch this living household. Touch this spiritual household. Touch every member, God, that you have put into this body. Strengthen us, God. And cause us to realize that the trials that come, the difficulties that come, they are not to destroy us. They are to make us ever stronger. They are there to stair-step us up to the next level, to bring us to a greater place of selflessness and, an, and a purer love for, for God and our, and our brethren, those around us. God, they're there to make us, to refine us, to purge out the dross to do away with the, the small things to reach God. Because you don't want something that's nearly pure. You want something that's absolutely pure. And it's not up to us to produce it. It's us, up to us to be involved as you direct. But ultimately, it is your hand that will save us all. It is you that will bring us through. But we have a responsibility uh, to make war in this world, to heal those we find, God, that are broken to educate those, Lord God, we find that have no understanding. In the name of Yeshua, let this word sink down deep into our spirit, let it become part of who we are, let it resonate forever. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Comments, complaints? Anybody at all? Thank you very much, Miss Alexander. Praise God. I disappeared. Quite welcome. And to the to the lovely people in Slidell, Louisiana, I had all your beans for breakfast yesterday. <laughs> I'm sorry, I won't ever see them again. <laughs> Praise God. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have anything to say, um, I'm going to conclude this. Uh, have a blessed week. This will be up. And this will be posted shortly. Do you have something to say, Caleb? So I love you. We love you, brother. I wish we could talk you into coming to Louisiana, but the will of God is the will of God. All right, ladies God and gentlemen. You, God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.